Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Patty Norris Lubold, and I am a parent helper on the uh, high school redesign project. And so tonight we're here for a little refresher uh, to kind of back us up to the announcement that we made in April uh, talking about academy redesign. And I have with us our illustrious academy leads here um, who are teachers uh, at the high school, and they're going to introduce themselves. But just a little housekeeping that I want to go through. You have some handouts. Uh, in front of you, that's an FAQ, so frequently asked questions that we've had over the last year about high school redesign, and also a graduate profile, which will indicate what we expect our students will graduate with through this academy system. Behind me, you will see a large piece of paper, and that is going to be our parking lot. So if there are questions that we cannot answer, or if you have a great idea that we haven't thought of before, we want to capture that. I'm also sending around a notebook, and that notebook is um, asking for your name and your email address, and that is so that we can contact you if you have a question we can't answer, or if we want to send up any follow-up to this meeting. So without further delay, I'm going to turn this over to Joe Crashane. He's going to introduce himself and his fellow colleagues. Thank you, Patty. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Joe. Um, I'm an English teacher here at Hoyoke High School, and I have been for the past six years. This is my sixth year. Um, and before we formally kick things off with any question and answers, and before I introduce my colleagues, I just wanted to speak a little bit um, from my point of view um, why I got involved with this work. Um, so I was actually in this room a month ago, um, and I had students um, who were a part of our school newspaper, which I'm the advisor, um, and they were sitting right on this stage, and they were hosting their own podcast in which they interviewed Alex Morris and Jay Ferreira, who at the time were running for mayor. Um, and I was really blown away by like what these students accomplished. Like They hosted a really professional podcast. Um, they applied their learning in ways that was really deep and enriching. Um, later that week, that Saturday, Friday, I came here to Hoyoke High School and I watched a group of students put on a haunted house here. I don't know if any of you heard or attended that. Um, I walked through and I saw students um, with walkie-talkies, like making sure they were in position. I saw students dressed up, some seats down here, some students dressed up with, the, with gore. Um, they were running a haunted house. The hallways were filled with smoke. It was really cool and the students did it all themselves. Um, I think back to Last year, when Kenny Roche uh, made that Stop the Violence video that legitimately went viral, he did that with the support of both video production and the restorative justice group. Um, I think about any of you who have been to our yearly musicals know what a great production that is. Two years back, students wrote and produced and directed their own play. So all these things are a roundabout way of me saying that those of us who know Hoyoke High School and have for a long time know that these really deep enriching learning experiences have always happened here. Um, part of the reason I decided to take over the school newspaper and put it online is because I was kind of interested in like getting the word out about these things that people didn't know about. And so when this idea for a redesign of what secondary school could be came along, I hopped on board because what I saw from a teacher's perspective was a chance for those things not to happen in isolation, right? Like right now, they happen if you have a really motivated teacher with some time or a group of students who take the initiative. My goal is to take those really engaging experiences with this redesign and make it on purpose, make it intentional, built into the coursework so that all students have access to these really cool deep learning experiences. So my just wanted people to know where I'm coming from, why I got involved in this work. Um, and so, once again, Joe Crashane, English teacher at Hoyoke High School. Um, I'm currently the redesign lead for the Performing and Media Arts Academy. Um, and my colleagues to my left will introduce themselves. All right. Hi, folks. I'm Jacob Belanger. I've been a teacher here at Holyoke High School for five years. This is my sixth year teaching. Uh, I teach mathematics, and currently I am working at designing the Medical and Life Sciences Academy. Hi guys, there's seats down up front if you're feeling crowded up back there. <laughs> I'm Megan Harrison. Um, <laughs> I've been teaching in Holyoke for 13 years, 10 years at this building. I'm an English teacher as well, and I'm just leading the Community and Global Studies Academy Design. Good evening, I'm Marcus Holt, and I've been teaching at Dean Technical High School for 12 years as the Engineering and Mathematics teacher, and I'm leading the Technology, Engineering, and Design Academy. 
Thanks, Marcus. So tonight what we're going to do is I had the pleasure of speaking with the Academy leads a little bit um, in detail earlier tonight. And we kind of talked about their, their rationale, what they, why, why they got involved in the work, but also why it's going to be meaningful for your students. I have t uh, two children in Hoyle Public Schools. One will be a senior next year. Um, the other is coming up. He's in seventh grade. And so I have a keen interest in this as well. And so I think that you'll find that some of their responses are illuminating. And then after those four questions, we'll open it up uh, to the group for you to ask your questions. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so Marcus, I'm going to hit you up first. Sounds great. <laughs> um, so tell, if you could tell the, the group in your professional opinion, um, how does the, the academy system help Holyoke students? So I've been in the design process, redesign process here at Holyoke for over a year now. I traveled with several teachers and administrators and community members around the country to see, look at different models that might or might not be as helpful for Holyoke students to progress better through their education. One of the reasons we landed on the academy system is because we went to other districts and other communities and saw when students really had that choice between I want to study this kind of career or this kind of sector or I have this strong interest in the way I think and the way I learn, for many of them, it really helped increase their passion for their learning. So it wasn't just, I'm going to math class, I'm going to English class. They were really much more passionate because math was now about social justice, or math was something had something to do with performance. That passion kept them engaged in their classes, whereas they otherwise, otherwise might have been, eh, OK, I do school because I have to do school. They're actually like, oh, this is interesting and fun for me. So they were engaged. That engagement also helped them start to look to their future and say, high school isn't just a step that I have to finish to get on to, with the rest of my life. This is something that will help me on the next step. So they were engaged. They're now looking into the future. Why am I doing this? And that helps them understand better why we're building those essential skills like critical thinking, good communication. So those three points of being engaged, being future looking, and help building basic skills with a purpose really help those students make high school meaningful. And so we're hoping through the academy system, we aren't going to make every student perfect, but a lot of our students who are otherwise thinking, this is not great, will now start to think, this is really for me. One student we saw at our reverse job shadow two weeks ago, last week, last week, Carrie Ann graduated from here three or four years ago, and she only had a small experience with going over to Holyoke Medical uh, Center and really getting a hands-on experience with what it meant to be in the nursing profession, and it really changed her entire outlook on high school. She really was then able to focus on, oh, why am I finishing high school? Because I want to get to this next step. And that's why I think the academy system will really help high school students here in Holyoke. So Jake, you're up. <laughs> um, how has this work been guided? So what expertise are you basing this work, this academy system on, if you can share your insight there? So a lot of this work um, are, has been guided originally and it still continues to be guided with, through the, the work of our teacher team work, um, teacher teams. Uh, we have various teacher teams that work before and after school on, at the, starting last year, the 2016-17 school year, with uh, the research and development. Um, we began with working on the programs of study in our teacher teams and uh, through the graduate profile that all of you have in front of you. Uh, this graduate profile is really the foundation of what all of our work moving forward is is really anchored to. And um, other, yep, you guys can come on in. There's actually some more seats up there. Yep, there's plenty of seats. There's plenty of seats, yep. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so, and other, other uh, teacher um, work teams that, like Marcus spoke to, the innovations team last year, uh, where a lot of our teachers traveled across the country to other school districts, um, researching programs that are, are, are innovative and, and being implemented with success. Uh, I was able to travel with a, a group of teachers to California, where we, uh, we, we were able to 
sort of shadow uh, a cohort of students at the Summit School, which is a, a linked learning school. Um, we, we traveled through two classrooms. Uh, we're, we first started in a science class where students were working on these constructed water pur purification systems that they made themselves out of water bottles and different materials and different uh, levels of um, particulates that they were just siphoning muddy water uh, through and doing you know, qualitative and quantitative uh, data collection based on the water purification systems that they made. And then we followed them into their history class where they were learning about the Industrial Revolution and the pollution that was created uh, through the water systems off the byproduct of the industries. So the students were experiencing this connected content between their, their coursework. It, it was a true linked learning experience for the students. Um, and they were extremely engaged. Um, they, they, were, they found the, revel the relevance in the content that they were learning. You know, a lot of times in, in my math class, the students ask, why am I learning this? So this, this type of model really lends itself to the relevance on why they're learning the, the content. Um, and then in addition to, to this experience uh, where we were doing this research and development, other supports throughout the district that the district has invested in, um, a lot of, uh, we have a number of consultants, educational consultants, that are, are highly needed in terms of, you know, master scheduling. Right now we're working with a master scheduling consultant that is, is extremely helpful because even though I'm a math teacher. I've never done master scheduling before, so on this scale, so this is that things like that are really um, important to to find exterior help with. Um, other consultants like uh, Connect Ed um, with Robert Curtis. They have a lot of material and content from um, districts that le are leading education in Massachusetts and in uh, California and Connecticut. So we're, we're collaborating with um, consultants outside as well that help support our, our pro progress moving forward. Great, thank you. Yeah. Megan, <coughs> you've, been a teacher, you've been a teacher for a while here and you've seen many students come and go. What spoke to you about this approach? What are the benefits, uh, would you say? <clears throat> Excuse me. Marcus and Jake spoke to this a little bit, but I think it's the interest, engagement, and being able to personalize these pathways for the students that connect to the real world experience, because that's what the, the real thing is, the link not only to the content, but also to the, to the real world. And I can say, just in terms of content, when I'm teaching my English classes, the books that the kids are most interested in are the ones that they get to choose for themselves. Like they get to choose their independent reading project. They get to choose the book they want to write their senior paper on. And that makes all the difference for them, I think. And it's not just about the content in the classes that they already like, it's also about learning through a lens so maybe the content that wasn't so accessible to them before is. Like for example, last year I had a senior who is now in school to be an English teacher who was doing really well in my class and, and loved that but was having a challenge in math. And Jake came up with this really creative and cool capstone project that allowed for her to, have, to be hooked in and interested in the math class because of the lens she was able to do it through. Let me speak to that. So, uh, so let's just say this, this student, um, math wasn't her favorite subject, and we, so the design of this, this kind of like culminating uh, project really was um, created through the, the, the work teams that we had last year uh, when we were developing the, the graduate profile and uh, some of the, the capstone criteria that we're looking to create for the capstone um, senior capstone that these students in ninth and 10th grade will be working uh, and leading up to. Um, we, it was really, really created um, through this team. And I, we're, the vision is for the student to really have as much choice as possible. So the, the project, I want to speak to the project a little bit. The project um, had certain criteria, mathematical modeling. Um, it had a writing piece reflection. Um, they had to do research, and they, but they had to choose their own topic. So this student uh, chose, she, she was interested in makeup. So she, wanted to, she, she originally wanted to be a makeup artist, and I said, that's great. So, so let's talk about makeup. Let's, and let's, let's, look through, um, let, let's look through makeup as color, and what is color? So she started her research with, with what is color. 
And uh, this course actually was, was trigonometry. It was at the end of a, a trigonometry um, unit. And we went over some applications on how light is, is reflected and color is from light. Is Light is all, just so we all, we all learned something today, uh, <laughs> light is actually all the colors of the rainbow. And when uh, you reflect light, it, it bounces different wavelengths and, and different frequencies of, of light. That's why we see color. That's why all of our clothes are different colors, because the light is actually reflecting a certain wavelength that our brain is recognizing as a certain frequency, which recognizes it as a certain color. So this is, this is part of her research. She learned, she's learning about what light is and, and how to measure light. Um, and she modeled all the foundational colors in makeup through a trigonometric wave function. And then from that wave function, she graphed it, and she learned about how light is reflected through content, um, through the content of the, of the course, but through, through a, a subject that she chose and the subject that she was interested in. So the research had meaning. Uh, and I believe through this one project, she learned more about trigonometry than the entire unit combined for the four weeks. So, uh, so this is, these are the type of activities and the type of student-centered learning that we're trying to incorporate into our curriculum for this academy model. Thanks, that's Thank great. Um, so just in knowing that in, over the last year as we've been talking as a community about redesign, um, there has been um, some various questions that have been asked, um, some pain points for people trying to wrap their minds around what is an academy, how does it fit, um, and so I wanted to put Joe on the hot seat and kind of ask him um, what type of concerns he's heard about and so far and, um, and you know, what he thinks of them and, and what are some solu so solutions that you might have had. Right, yeah. Um, I feel really qualified to talk about some of the community's concerns. Um, <laughs> I've heard a lot of them, usually in Stop and Shop for some reason. People really, something about Stop and Shop makes people want to share. Um, I've started going there at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night. It's great. There's nobody there. Um, so I think, I think the biggest concern I hear from parents is around um, their student who is doing well and the perception that our work here in terms of course design, in terms of making um, things more linked, is going to diminish that student's experience, is going to, for lack of a better term, dumb things down. Um, and I can say, like, I mean, the four of us up here are teachers. I have no interest, zero, in making Hoyok High School less academically rigorous. Like, what would I be doing if I did? Um, I actually think our goal, do I think some students who are struggling will be more engaged through this work? Yes. I do think that will have a positive effect on them. But I also think the students who are currently doing well will also benefit from this. Um, that anecdote that I said about the podcast where they interviewed the two um, mayoral candidates, those were three students who are academically doing really well. And they were doing the kind of project that we're aiming for to be the ultimate goal of high school. And I don't think any of them felt like that was not academically rigorous. I thought they thought it was engaging and they were applying their learning. Um, I have a class every single day of 32 students. Um, it's an elective class. Most of them are seniors. And they are, for the most part, the students who are currently doing really well at Hoyoke High School. And I've been talking to them about this work and about how my goal is for their senior year here to be much more meaningful. Because oftentimes, I mean, we all went to high school. Oftentimes, senior year is not that meaningful, right? Um, students sometimes are put into classes they might not have interest in just because they need to fill their schedule, they need the credits. Um, so the ultimate goal for us, for me, um, anybody who, who, who says what I'm doing is like somehow going to negatively affect a student who's succeeding at Hoyoke High School, I'd love to have a conversation about that because that's not my perspective on it. Um, the other concern that I've heard a lot from people is more philosophical. Um, I think whenever you propose a change, um, people have some strong feelings about it, especially at a school like this. Like this is Hoyoke High School, right? Like people, people take a lot of pride in this. People have roots. People feel really passionate about this. And I just want people to understand that like I totally get that. Um, I've lived in Hoyoke my entire life. I went to Donahue Peck and then here. I graduated in 2003. Um, I understand how we feel about this. Um, and I think, you know, 
being one, a district in receivership, being uh, an urban district, like we are sometimes like the nexus of some of the really controversial things going on, like education reform, right? Like standardized testing, privatization. And I think sometimes this work gets caught up in that and people, people kind of view what we're doing with suspicion um, because from their point of view, it's like these outsiders coming and trying to, to mess up this thing that they really value. And so if I could just, if, if no other message gets across today, I just want people to know that like, I get how much people care about this place because I do too. And I would not be a part of something that I thought was like dismantling what we like about it, so. I just have one, just add, I just wanted to ad lib on that. So y all of you have been teachers um, for some time in the system. Um, how would you say education has to evolve? I, I guess my, that's my question. You know, what you see it in the workforce, things changing, technology changing at a rapid pace. Um, do you see that happening or the need to happen in school? Well, I think um, one of the, the really cutting edge innovative schools have already figured out that um, good teaching is like interdisciplinary, right? Like the, if you can make a connection between what the students learn in science and English and history, like that's good teaching no matter who you are. And I think that the really, really cutting edge schools that exist today are doing that. And so that's the most exciting aspect about this to me is to have a chance to try and have us maybe like be that school, so. So, I've been teaching over at Dean for quite some time, and I really like it there. I know it's, it's got a uh, checkered history, but one of the things I've seen in the evolution of vocational education, of technical education, and this sort of morphing into career education is that in this century, you don't get to pick one job that you're going to be in forever. You're not, I mean, maybe if you're like really good, I'm going to be a nurse forever, and you're a really good nurse, okay, there's a few jobs still left. But for many of us, it's I am a professional at this, and then I'm a professional at something else, and then something else. So it's not as useful to teach a student a string of facts anymore. It's much more useful to teach the student how to learn on their own, to teach the student where their strong points in learning are, where their strong points in progression are, so that as they progress between 30 and 35, they might need to learn a whole new career. And we don't want them to be stuck in, well, this is what I learned in high school, and this is what I'm gonna do forever, we want them to be able to be flexible enough to think, I learned the skills that will help me move into that next career. I want to move from being a carpenter into a master craftsman and then maybe make my own television show. Who knows? There's a million careers out there in this modern world that move so quickly. Okay. So before we get started, um, in opening up for questions, I just wanted to reiterate there was a notebook that was passed around where there is um, an e I'm asking for your email address and your name. And that is just so that we can follow up with you in case there's additional questions. Um, so if, if anyone hasn't signed that, um, please do so because we'd want to get you answers and record your ideas. Um, again, this is our parking lot. So if there's something that you want us to capture, we will capture it there um, as our academy leads are going through the scheduling and preparing um, for next year when the academy is launched. So I am going to look for a show of hands on who would like to ask a question of our panelists. Very easy right in front. <laughs> Brian Borgard. I have, uh, I have two kids at the high school now, two that are in college and benefited from Holyoke High School. I, I think the linked learning with the uh, academies uh, ending with the capstone, I think, is is a fantastic idea, and you know, I think will will make the kids more well rounded and prepared for the next step. I think the biggest question I have is that's not the way the the the, the country and the states are, are are they're so focused on tests and data and. So how do we still ensure that the students um, can still do well and make the data look good? <laughs> Great question. And you want to? Yeah, let's hear it. Um, yeah, that's 100% valid question. Um, I would just like, I think that, I think the hope is 
um, that the academy theme, whatever it is, um, and the linked learning has is kind of like the hook for students who are currently maybe not attending class, maybe struggling. Um, and that, that will, because we're not like the core academic classes will still be there. Like they'll still be prepared for the test. Um, I think our goal is to have that. And on top of it, have this like motivator to have more students want to be engaged in school. Um, because if you're in the performing and media arts Academy and you really have an interest in performance, um, maybe you're not the biggest fan of math, but either your math teacher is doing something to hook you to learn those concepts that are going to help you do well in the test, or um, you just really want to attend your performance class that day because you're really into it, so you know that you have to be in math or otherwise you won't be able to. I've had three of your boys in my classes. Um, <laughs> So as someone who's like an English person, right? Math in the class, my geometry class was like total torture for me in high school. But if I had, I would have learned more, I think, personally, like just listening to Jake describe that trigonometry, and I'm not a trigonometry expert either. Like I think as a student who wasn't so good in math, I would have learned more and, and been and done better on those standardized tests had the math been something I felt like was really applicable to me and my interest. And and also, one of the core focuses that we have in this academy design is the curriculum. And right now, we're working on not just new courses, but also revising the, course, the courses that we have currently and really pinpointing where, where in, in, the, in, the, in the course progression are, are, do we need to strengthen in order to meet those, those needs for, the, for those standardized tests. So those standardized tests are still on our radar for sure. Great. Um, <laughs> guy in the back of the class. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in a sense, it sounds awesome because the idea of an academy and being able to pick, I guess, where you would like to go. But I remember in eighth grade myself, I, gra I graduated in 2003 too with Joe. <laughs> um, coming from Magnet Middle School, and you get the choice in eighth grade to either go to Dean or Holyoke High, it kind of sounds the same a little bit, but not exactly the same. But in a sense, there's some stuff that kind of like, I feel like intertwine. So I went through exploratory for a little bit where they take you on the field trip, but it was only a one day theme. Whereas this might be, I'm assuming a whole freshman year, which could be a waste of a freshman year if they don't want to do that the next year. So that's one of the things that I would be afraid of. And then um, the, um, I don't, um, I just arrived. So I don't know what it is that you guys are offering in a sense in regards to themes. But like, for me, it's like where I thought Dean could have done a lot better job is job trend, like helping kids transfer into jobs that are like locally in the city. Mm -hmm. So like gas and electric or uh, holy water power at the time. Now it's water works. But like, providing those type of opportunities so that when they graduate high school, they directly go into those positions instead of just like trying to find an automotive job or a barber job, even though you still have to get a whole bunch more hours within the practice so that you could get finally licensed, which costs more money on top of everything else. So to me, it's like the curriculum as you had mentioned, but like the strength of it and the value that's gonna add to the kid that graduates high school and it may not go to college. Mm -hmm. And like the career readiness attached to it. That's for me. Yeah. Are we going to agree to start? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but answer that question. It's a great question. Thank you for that question, by the way. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. So well, one of the uh, one of the core tenets of the Academy Design model is uh, the work based learning. Um, tenant. And what work-based learning is, it's, it's not, you know, training a student for the, the workforce. It's not, that's not what it's meant to be. It's, it's more of a, a student uh, engaging with local community and local industry partners um, to, to, to kind of make that connection be, between not only the, the graduate profile that we, that you have in front of you and those, those essential skills that you need to, to be proficient or successful in the workforce, um, but to really gain experience and, and connect the content in the classroom with the local industry. Uh, so we, we just started, uh, we had our first initial, um, I wouldn't say pilot, but this is, this is our first initial event 
for work-based learning just this past week with the reverse job shadow. It's, it was, it's sort of like a career fair that we labeled as reverse job shadow where we had local um, industry partners um, coming into the classrooms for their freshman academy students and uh, they, they, they walked through four classrooms, they cycled through four classrooms like they were you know, a student, instead of students going there to shadow, to, to job shadow, we actually had the industry coming in, uh, hence reverse job shadow. And uh, it was very powerful, you know, making the connection with the local industry and the, the students were able to learn about um, the different careers that were linked to the, the academies. Um, in the academies, we have the medical and life sciences, we have technology, engineering, design, um, medium performing arts, and then community and global studies. So. The, the local industries are really excited to partner up. We, right now we have over 40, and that's growing by the week, um, local industry and community partners that want to support us in this, this academy model. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, like, so we're starting with that, like bringing them in, and as the, the progression of the courses develops, like we were someone was speaking to 12th grade, like they, are, they have so much room in their schedule where they could be doing something like yeah. just like you're talking about. So that is one of the goals that we have too. So like these partners that we're just starting like baby steps with, we're hoping eventually down the line we'll host our kids as for internships or um, all kinds of other things. We're actually looking to pilot uh, 20 plus internships uh, this, this um, uh, spring semester. And uh, Jake and I actually, I was really surprised, I'm not sure why, but I was surprised by how game the local business industry community is to to do this work. Jake and I spoke like two months ago, somewhere in like October, um, at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast. Um, and it was really early. It was like 7.15. Um, and when we had we were preparing for it, we were saying, you know, we prepared like a slideshow. We had our remarks about the academy and how they could help. And we expected, you know, people to be half listening while they eat. So, you know, we were going to make it short. They're not, you know, they're, they have their day to get to, um, and they were 100% engaged. Like, it was a room full of people just staring at us. It was actually kind of intimidating. Um, <laughs> but at the end, they filled out forms, like, how much would you be willing to help support this academy model? Would you be willing to take Hoya Public School students um, to, to shadow you for a day, to perhaps do an internship? And they're really supportive, so hopefully we are making those connections. Like, it would be really cool if a student could make a local connection through this work that would help them carry on. So. Thank you. Eileen, I know you had a question. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, I have a question about the P3 program that's currently done at PEC, and it's only up to the eighth grade. Will that continue through to the high school so these children aren't all of a sudden thrown into the Wolves Den after they've had this very specialized uh, learning program at PEC? And how do you anticipate incorporating P3 into the high school in this academy structure? So the, the P3 program, which I'm not 100% versed in, but I have some familiarity with, mm -hmm. is about individualized pathways for learning. And those sort of individualized pathways that were the impetus for P3, that were the inspiration for P3, were also some of the inf same inspiration for our academy model. As we look at students coming up from that program, their individualization will be best reflected through their, what is the, uh, yeah the map, the, the individualized learning plan. Now, will it be as beautifully structured as the P3? I can't guarantee that. Like, I'd love to tell you we're just gonna keep P3 going. And if we can get the resources and if we can figure out how to do that, we want every child to have that opportunity to have an individualized learning plan. As that student steps into ninth grade, there may be, as it is for all eighth graders into ninth grade, some uh, growth pains as they struggle to see a wider frame as the customization for their individual learning, individualized learning plan maybe has to merge with other students. So will it be a customizable? Yes. Will it, they, can they take their individual choices to some extent? Will we be as um, flexible as the P3 program? I can't promise that. Do our best, but it's not going to be 100%. Only because I think the expectations are 
the kids enter this program with the expectation that this is going to be the pathway of learning through graduation, and I think it's a real concern what those eighth graders are going to have. We're going to have to, and I apologize for this, since we don't have the expertise in this, we're going to have to put this in the parking lot and hand it off to our administrators so that they can, but we definitely will get back to you on that or one of our administrators will get back to you on yeah, it. And Steve is here right behind you, so I'm gonna put him on the hot seat and uh, have him speak to that. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great question. We've invested a lot we've uh, in the P3 program and there's been a lot of positive um, support from the families and the students that some are in their second year. Uh, we have already begun discussions about how do we continue into the ninth grade academy. Um, you know, for the, for ninth graders coming up because the uh, oldest group is in eighth grade, they're moving on to ninth grade. And so we've already had preliminary conversations with the folks who have supported its implementation at PEC about continuing it. How it's going to fit into the academies once students make choices beyond ninth grade is something that we still need to get answers to. So I think it's important that one of the things we wanted to collect was a list of things we have to provide answers to. I think our plan right now, I would say preliminarily, is to continue it on to ninth grade. And then beyond, as, as students, have to, students make decisions about academies um, following ninth grade, I think we still have a year left to... Uh, work on that. I think for sure our our interest right now is continuing it on to ninth grade because we have basically a whole section, enough for um, um, a section of the ninth grade academy coming up from PEC because we have four classrooms. I think it's four in eighth grade. Uh, is it four? I think it's four in eighth grade that are coming up to the high school who have all had the P3 experience. And we've seen good results. So if we've seen good results from it, um, we'd be foolish to make any significant changes there. Thank you. All right. I know there was a question. Read the, the room over there. here. I don't need the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, reco it's recording. Yeah. So maybe. Uh, hi, my name is Joe Dornian. Um, my fourth child going through Hoyle High School. Uh, I have two in college currently. Um, quick question in regards to where you travel to get these models from. Were they comparable to the demographics of Hoyoke and also the financial status of the, the Hoyoke residents and the funding available to run this model? And one other question was. It seems like it's, I may be focusing on the wrong point, it seems like the, uh, a tool to keep the children engaged at the high school level, but it sounds like there's limited conversation in regards to what it's preparing them if they're not looking for a trade, if they're not looking to, if they want to go on to college and, and um, excel in academics, because we have SATs, you know, all the standardized testing they have in regards to that. Ms. Beauregard touched base on that a little bit earlier, but it, it I just hope the kids who are more focused on the, Collegiate viewpoint are not going to be lost in this shuffle. Thank you. You want? Um, you have to remind me of your first point, but the second point. Um, <laughs> so I, I think, and one of the things on that FAQ is um, I don't view this as job trading. Um, for some students, might they find a passion that they didn't know they had and want to pursue into a career? And will we have the Availability to try and help them support that, yes. Um, but I think that, um, and I keep going back to my example. I don't. I'm not saying the thing that I do is so great, but it's just like, it's it's what I know. Um, is the school newspaper that I do, and that's a group of 32 students who are all planning on going to college, are all um, really high achieving. Um, I like to think I'm providing a cool experience for them that enriches their learning. Um, and I'm under no illusion that they're all going to go on to be journalists, right? Most of them probably won't. Um, so for me, I think the work we're doing um, is for everybody, whether, they're, whether they do have career aspirations right after high school or they want to do college and then a career, whatever their path is. Um, I, none of the things that I've done in this work have been with an eye towards like, you know, you high school student, you're going to pick your career and that, I think the academies are um, just more of an engaging hook. So I would say that I think like, as I said earlier, I think this is something that will really benefit a student going to college. Um, and they're still going to get their core academics, the SAT prep and all those things. I just remember the first part. Was it the preparation, middle schools? No, it was the, uh, the, the, the model. Oh, right. Were they comparable to the Hoyle demographics? Right. You were, yeah, you guys, yeah. I just wanted to add on something that Joe was saying. 
Um, we're also working not just with community partners, but with a large number of university partners. We're working with Westfield State, we're working with HCC, we're working with the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We're gonna expand our du dual enrollment options. We're gonna have early college options for students. So it's not just the community partners, but also university partners that are both helping us design the courses that we're doing for the curriculum, as well as providing opportunities for students to go to their campuses and, and see the same kind of things as they would in an industry in a university. So speaking to the point of when we looked at models, were they comparable to the demographics of Holyoke? They were, in, in a short statement. They weren't perfect. They weren't you know, exactly the same income, exactly the same percentage of Latino versus white versus Asian, but they were very similar. We, we spent a lot of time in California partly for that reason, because to find other parts of the country that have this sort of 50-50 Latino white mix is not that easy in Minnesota. So you have to go where, where the population is. And we did see some of the schools where there had previously been a divide, at least this is a story they told us, and why wouldn't we believe them? There had previously sort of been a cultural divide inside the community. And they were saying one of the things that brought the student community together so that there wasn't really a, as much of a divide was when the students were focused on their future as far as whether it's a career that's after college or it's a career that's before college, they stopped thinking of themselves as smaller communities and they started thinking of themselves as professionals with a goal beyond high school. So that sense of am I culturally this background or culturally this background got a little bit lost in the idea that they were now professionals preparing for the next step, whether it's college or community college or a PhD, or straight to a career. So this ability to focus on something outside of their strict demographics really helped bring those communities together is the story they told us. I think that's some parts of your questions. I just want to make sure that we cover at least all of them so far. OK. You already have the mic, so I'm going to take it away. Hi, uh, Laura Walsh. I'm the parent of two current students, one of whom is a freshman. Um, I'm especially interested in the the statement in the first paragraph at the top of the second page of the FAQs, um, it sounds like the students will have access to the classes they want to take. However, that leads me to wonder what's going to differentiate one academy from another. So if my student wants to take, you know, AP Physics and um, and the Herald class, you know, is, are these open to every student? And if that's the case, what's going to define a, an academy? Any volunteers? Yeah. I feel like I'm answering all the questions. This really isn't fair. Um, they know stuff, too. Um, so I would say that, like, the academy, um, will be, the, the academy experience will come in, I can't see you, I'm, I'm not ignoring you, um, will, will come in um, classes that supplement like the core. Um, so you will have a cohort likely that you, tra that, that, that you travel with, but like you'll see so the students have the same interest with you in those academy courses. Um, but I mean, when we're, pro when we're doing our programs of study, we all have rooms for electives. Um, it's not, you know, this isn't a prescribed roadmap. You must take this and that and that. Um, if you want to complete the academy concentration, then there are courses that we're going to require you to take. Um, but I think that um, none of us is in a position right now designing this where we're going to say, like, if you're in my academy, you must take this English. You can't take AP. I don't think any of us have that intention. Um, so I think the academy experience comes in those supplementary classes and also in the experiences beyond, right? If we have a reverse job shadow day where people from the industry come in that are tailored to that academy, then they all come together and they see each other and the, the student would, would partake in that. Uh, maybe they have a field trip or things of that nature. So it's, it's a, being a part of this group, but you're still a part of the school. If, does that answer your question sufficiently? Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can build upon that a little bit. So with, with the, the academy model, the vision is, is to have uh, courses that are, that are somewhat linked together and to have this, this somewhat, um, this not a, somewhat of a focused uh, content that you're, you're 
really diving deeper into. Uh, so for, for example, uh, the, the Medical and Life Sciences Academy, I have um, one of my concentrations that I'll, that I'll be offering is environmental. So students in environmental science uh, could be taking their, their, um, their you know, chemistry course and during B block and then have an environmental elective um, C block that will be li somewhat linked together. And that, that curriculum, that focused curriculum with, those, uh, with, with those, that cohort of students will have that experience of being um, within an academy I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but they'll have an experience that is is different from all the other academies, all the, all the, all the other concentrations, and within that those uh, specific content courses that will be provided, there will be experiences, work-based learning experiences that will be specific to that content. Uh, so it, my environmental um, science concentration, I am partnering up with uh, this, this environmental science. Um, researcher, um, Lily Rajik, uh, she was currently, she's currently at, from uh, Northeastern University and doing research on water purification systems. And I'm designing uh, a, a curriculum with her, alongside with her, uh, to, to incorporate these experiences with students that will actually be working side by side with her, doing research, state-of-the-art research with state-of-the-art equipment. Um, with water purification systems. So they'll have, this cohort of students will have these spe specified experiences within uh, their academies. And it is part of one of the core tenets of the academy model, equity of access. And we, we're, we wanna make sure that all students have access to all the AP courses, uh, dual enrollment courses that, that, that are, are for students that are really geared towards that higher level, uh, beyond uh, secondary, um, post-secondary level um, uh, content. So is it more in the electives where it's gonna be delineated? So you gave the example of environmental science. Mm -hmm. That means from an, a, a student from another academy won't take that class. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that, that specialized course within the, acad the, the academy concentration. Hi, I'm Kelly Grasso. I have two sons. One's in college and one's a senior here, but I'm really coming here as a teacher in the, one of the eighth grades um, here at, Sol well, at Sullivan. But my concern is two part. As a parent of students who in the traditional program have done well, I see them with very varied interests. Like my son Patrick's in your calculus class now, and uh, he loves it. You know, which I've never said about math before. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and he, but he really loves his history. He likes his English. Like, I, as a, I would be worried if he would have had to specialize at 15. I'm worried about him going to business school next year because I'm thinking he might not like it being that narrow. So I have parents ask me all the time about their kids as an eighth grade teacher, particularly as an eighth grade special education teacher. They think that I have the answers that I don't about the changes that are coming in. So how do we advise parents? When they, who do we direct that to? And the uh, second slightly different question, the concern I hear coming up from kids who talk in, at my home all the time is how are they gonna keep it united? Is it going to change Holyoke High? And I know Joe addressed that a little bit, but like with the two campuses and the sports and going into an academy, will you know your whole class? Will you have that cohesive sense? I look at the class of 2018, I'm very happy with the class of 2018. They are a good, solid group of kids. Would they have that same cohesiveness had they gone through four years as academy products? Maybe their academics would have been better, but I, I really like that group of kids and I would like to see that experience continue. So those are my two questions. So uh, while I appreciate that there's a lot of great things going on at Holyoke High right now, and the, the classes that I see coming out of this school, I, I'm impressed with a lot of the young people. We want to continue to give them the great service that, that we feel they're getting now. And we also want to bring up some of the students who might not be as engaged and maybe aren't making it to 12th grade. And so we want to make sure that by building smaller learning communities, which may seem like it's not making everybody cohesive across the whole 12th grade, 
we think if we have some slightly smaller learning communities, students who might not be standouts in their grade might get a little more room to shine because they're in a smaller group. They have a, a more of a small family feel. And so maybe the student who's sort of not feeling like a superstar, if they have an area where they're really interested, now they get a chance to shine. And so everybody has a chance to shine, but we'll still all be here under one roof. All, when we have a pep rally, it, it'll probably still be separated by sitting your grade. Yeah, yeah, so. Two roofs. Well, now are you talking the, su talking the, the South Campus? Right. right. Okay, right. so. How the, do you have a cohesive class of 2022? The South Campus With right two now. Different buildings. Like, the, how, how do you build that cohesion? So, the South Campus right now is a separate campus. It has a separate graduating class. It's been that way for the last 12 years that I've worked there. Right. So that, that is not going to change right away. Next year, the students who are CTE students are going to be getting a CT, a career technical experience on the South Campus, and the students who otherwise would have been a traditional North Campus Holyoke High students will still be coming here. This, the career technical, of what you might have heard, is vocational students on the South Campus will be associated with academies. Like if you're in machine shop, you'll be associated with the technology engineering and design academy because we're similar type interests, similar type industry, we're mechanical, we make things with our hands. But they won't necessarily come to every event we do, but they will be if we have big events, if we have something that's, uh, that, they, that they would be interested in, some career connection, they'll actually be better connected next year than they are now. Because traditionally, those campuses, these campuses have been a complete split. Right, they've been two different schools, I understand that. But for my eighth grade students coming up, when I sit in an IEP meeting with these parents, whose kids are, are some of the ones who struggle, let's face it, it's an IEP meeting, right? They, they, what do I tell them their child should expect going forward? Or just go to the ninth grade academy and they'll explain it to you there? Like, like how, how are we going to get that information down to the middle school so that we can make it a more seamless flow up to the high school and just make people think that because whether your experience was good in high school or bad in high school, you want your child to have a good experience in high school. And they, they I, I feel like I don't have an answer for them now. I think that's a valid, I think that's a valid yeah. point. I, you know, and as a, you know, as a parent too, I can, I can definitely hear that, and I, I did capture that, but I know, Steve, I, I, I wonder if you want to talk about you know, your expectation of, of the eighth grade and, and sort of how that communication um, can be improved upon, because we can certainly capture it here, but if you had some thoughts. Yeah, I think, um, I think you, great, you bring up some great points, also about special education students as well. And so, I mean, that's why we're collecting a lot of this information tonight, so we can make sure we get the, you know, that, those answers. I think we, um, as we look at the, I think there's a lot that both campuses have to offer kids, um, and we haven't fully taken advantage of that over time. Like Dean has, the current Dean has a lot to offer students, Holyoke Kai does, and I think over time, we would like students to have experiences across both campuses. I don't think we're ready for that yet. We're not ready yet for kids to be moving back and forth between the two sites. And we're not ready to fold career and technical education into the academy model. We're not. We're just not at that place. May, some of the uh, shops that we have there fit n more nicely than others into the academy model, but we couldn't fit all of the experience. And what we heard from the community is that it was important to maintain career technical education. And we actually think there are more kids that can benefit from that experience uh, than are right now. Dean, uh, while we've, we've seen a transformation in Dean, we don't have enough kids who are taking advantage of those opportunities right now, and we have to do a better job of recruiting students there. We're gonna have a much tighter admissions policy at um, the South Campus, um, but as you know, right now, I think that's gonna be the work of the leadership team around how do you bring people together, because there's not gonna be as much back and forth as maybe, if I project five years out, I'd love to see kids have access, because each of our, we're lucky that we have two high school um, campus sites that offer very different experiences for kids, and I think kids would benefit from going back and forth. We're just not at that place yet, and I know that as a parent, com the parent community, they wouldn't feel good about yet about uh, kids going back and forth, and um, you know, uh, throughout the day. But as I think about like the dream down the road, is 
I think it would be great for kids to take some classes on the South Campus, some on the North Campus. I envision having a way for kids to go back and you know have a, a shuttle between Holyoke Community College, the South Campus, the North Campus. Um, but we're not there yet, and I don't expect to be there next year. So, um, but I, and, and as far as the communication efforts, uh, we've already talked about the need to go to every school, speak to the teachers at every school, at the eighth grade sites, including the Catholic schools, the charter school, um, and meet with families at every school, um, and do it as a united front, not the South Campus going at one time and the North Campus, but together going and speaking to um, uh, families uh, there and, and answering you know, uh, the questions that people will have about what's best for their child. So it would be safe to, to, when parents have these questions, just say, there's going to be We're coming. Year. We're coming. coming. We're coming. And we want the folks that are presented here tonight, we want uh, the leadership of the school uh, to, to, ha to be able to answer those questions for families. So I think the right answer is, that, that is just right. wait for uh, the, the Sullivan uh, information yeah. session that's coming. Just also, we have a session at Ian White this week, Thursday, and Joe is taking his show on the road to the citywide PTO meeting um, as well on Wednesday. So you can catch him there and put him on the hot seat again. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosalie Tinsley Williams, and I'm Ward 2 School Committee person. Um, I'm very excited about the redesign program. I was a single mom. Um, my boys started out at Sullivan School, and they both graduated from Dean Technical High. Years ago, people thought that when people went to technical schools, that was one step from jail, which is, was the wrong idea. My boys, they took the exploratory classes, they took um, cooking, they took all of the courses until they found out that they t wanted to be, they went in the distributive ed class, and then they took the business management course. They're 47 and 49 now, and they both excelled. And I'm very proud they got a really good education at Dean. Anything divided against itself is not going to stand. And for a long time, the school system was divided. Dean um, was like under, thrown under the bus, and Hoyoke High was up here. I'm happy that we are merging. I think now when the money comes in from the cherry sheet, we, it's going to go to one um, school. And I'm very happy about it. If you guys need my help, like I said, I was a single mother. It was tough raising them by myself, but they turned out pretty good considering. And I really believe this is going to work. We need to give it a chance, okay? Um, let's don't kill it before it starts. So I'm kind of a positive person. So if you need some positivity, <laughs> just call me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't mind it at all. But I really believe it's going to work out. Let's just put our heads together. Let's all work as a team. Of course, there's no I in team. And I think it's going to be good. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you had a few words. Yeah, I just want to say something. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I also want to say something about college because I, I, I appreciate the questions that have come. Uh, look, I, I'm disappointed with where kids go to college right now and in, in, in for coming out of Holyoke High. I think we could be doing a lot better, a lot better. Um, I, I, I don't for a second, I know it's cut, talked a lot about career here, um, and that's important, and we want, I think those experiences about engaging kids and motivating students is really important. But don't, I, I don't mistaken that, uh, we believe that this is a strategy to better prepare kids for higher ed as well. And these academies are all going to be linked in some way to higher education. We've got a lot of support from the HCC, from Westfield, from UMass. Uh, we just wrote some grants which we, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the, the governor's office uh, around um, early college models. And we have some preliminary information that's very positive around getting more funding to increase enrollment for kids. Um, in early college, and it's not just dual enrollment, it's like a full early college track. There's that, those are two different things. Dual enrollment is you take cor you know, courses, uh, a few courses here and there, but it's not connected in any way or, and articulated to higher ed. Um, the plan is to truly have early college, which is you're taking a number of courses that connect you to a pathway um, at, in higher ed. Now, whether you choose to pursue that or not, that's up to to, to, up to up to you, but it, this is also about putting our kids at a much better competitive advantage. We uh, the rest of the country is way ahead of Massachusetts 
right now. This is not an, an unusual, this, first of all, this doesn't have anything to do with receivership. Whether I was in a district that was in receivership or not, this is a model that I think is good for all kids. Um, it so happens that other parts of the country are doing this work. I just went with the president of HCC to a conference around, um, around this work, and it was kind of embarrassing how far back behind Massachusetts is, and where we, we, we heard from schools, you know, Virginia and um, the western part of the country that are doing this work and have been doing it since the uh, mid-2000s. Um, now, that being said, um, we are on the cutting edge in Massachusetts with this work. And it's exciting. It's, yeah, it's, it's daunt, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's, it's new, it's different. It's not something that other district, other districts are trying to learn from us right now. And frankly, I, I don't, I want, I'm pleased that with something we're first, you know, rather than following everybody else and being the last to adopt this, this work. But there are plenty of models that we seen and these folks visited. I wasn't lucky enough to be on those trips. Um, and somebody asked about funding. We do have a lot of funding coming from foundations who are supporting this. The Barr Foundation has put a lot of money into this work. Uh, they, they've done over the last two years. They plan to continue that funding as long as we continue to move in this direction around pathways. Uh, you know, they, they have supported where we are. And frankly, it's because we have people on the ground who are from this community, are teaching in our schools, have been here leading the work. I don't know the first thing about designing curriculum. I wasn't a high school person. I was an elementary and middle school person. I feel very strongly that we have four people here who care about this community, who are going to be here for a while, and are connected, you know, uh, who are, who are um, believe in this work long term. But I don't want anybody to mistake it, mistake that this is not about college, because it is about giving kids the option, and whether their career option, I don't, I don't think kids at 15 years old should be choosing careers, but I think kids should be much more engaged in school than they are right now in the Holyoke Public Schools, okay? And I think they should be better prepared to be successful when they graduate. And right now, yeah, we're getting more kids across the strict stage, but it's got to be more than the piece of paper. They've got to be better prepared, better motivated, better thinkers, be able to look across, you know, uh, interdisciplinary like uh, Joe was talking about. That's the best kind of learning. It's the best kind of teaching when we truly create those powerful experiences for kids, which frankly is not happening enough right now in the Holyoke Public Schools. I also, I won't put her on the spot, because, but... Oh, um, no, you can put her on the spot. She wants people on the spot. Um, so when I when I had a group of students, like I said, the, the 32 students I see every single day who are really high performing, who want to go to college, and I described the work we were doing, many of them got excited and said, yeah, that would actually be what we feel to be uh, a really more engaging and beneficial senior year. Like we could actually maybe be out in the world seeing some things, be working on these projects. Um, and they're all planning on going to college and they can see how that, that could enrich their experience. And in case you didn't believe me, I asked if Cassidy would come. So if she wants to be put on the spot, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, okay. I'm a senior at Holyoke High School and I've always been interested in engineering and Mr. Crochet said like, hey, you should write an article from about Mr. Holt for the TED Academy. And after I interviewed him, I was like, wow, like this is going to be a really good opportunity for students because since my freshman year, I've been trying to take electives that have to do with engineering, but like none of the classes really connected as well as I wanted them to. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. And I would have had loved to have that opportunity before I go to college. Marcus, can you explain the TED Academy and, and what your vision is there? I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> so TED standing for technology, for informational technology, E for engineering, and D for industrial design. Uh, information technology, most of you would know as computer programming, computer usage, computer software. Engineering, not the guy who drives the train, but uh, somebody who designs and creates and improves processes and products. And industrial designer is the part that most of the population wouldn't really know about. It's the difference between an Android phone and an Apple phone. It's the difference between that blender that everybody wants and that $20 blender you get at Kmart. It's really what makes a product a piece of art. And so in that academy, I'm hoping to not just bring students into this really exciting field that's fairly well compensated. Uh, if you're a problem solver, like a mechanical type, spatial relations kind of problem solver, because there's all sorts of problems they'll be solving as well. 
uh, if you're the kind of problem solver that likes those spatial relation problems, there's a place for you where you can start sooner. Because honestly, I was an engineer, an electrical engineer for years. I loved my career. I came to teaching because I was looking for something even more challenging. <laughs> and, uh, and I was competing against people who had been thinking about, thinking hard about engineering since they were 10. I was 10 years behind. The, the serious people in that industry, in that profession now, they are digging in and really curious about how does the world work through their vision from a very young age. And we're putting our young people at a slight, not a major, but a slight disadvantage by making them wait to choose. Now, they don't have to choose, but some are just, they're feeling they're in those gates ready to run at 14 and they'd be happy to make a choice. And some, they'll go through the process of being in academy and say, well, that was fun. I was in the TED Academy, but I think I want to be a nurse, or I think I want to be a reporter. But they'd be really well placed to operate the technology in a hospital. They'd be really well placed to report on technology. So it's not choosing that profession. It's not choosing that career. It's just kind of the way you think about the world. And if you see it that way, we're trying to give you a space where you can hang out with other people who see it that way and get to uh, brainstorm ideas? Um, I was just thinking, actually, about Ryan, right? So if someone like Ryan, who was very interested in, tech in engineering and design at that age, connecting right into what Marcus was saying. Like, and he designed his own, what was an app, or I'm the English person, so I don't remember exactly what it was. But like at 14, wouldn't he have benefited from being in a program that would have like, brought that interest all together? Yeah, just really quickly to piggyback, I think what Marcus said is like the, the way of thinking about the world, right? There are people who think like engineers. Um, and even if somebody goes to the TED Academy and decides to go in a radically different direction um, and, and doesn't want to become an engineer, I would still submit that from my point of view, they've benefited from being through a series of courses that has encouraged that way of thinking no matter what they want to do, especially if they want to go to college. So. So my question is, I think this is great, um, and I'm hearing a lot in regards to our regular ed students and the opportunities and visiting the schools and the different programs. I'm a special ed parent. I want to know what this is going to look like for my child and other children that are currently you know, in the basement at Holyoke High School, because we are working towards integrating our special ed students in this district. So what does it look like for them? Have they been thought of? Transitions are hard for these students. You're talking about two campuses. I know with a lot of shops, um, there, there are certain regulations stating, you know, we can't do this because of their disability. What accommodations are going to be made to give those students the same opportunities to both be able to go to both campuses and be a part of these academies that they're currently not really being integrated and a part of as this school district? So those are my concerns. Uh, I don't want to start by talking about the South Campus. I'm going to start by talking about the North Campus here because that's really where these four academies will be housed. And I've been having extensive conversations with the special ed and ELL departments because any student with a special learning need, we not only have to meet their accommodations by law, but just because it's the morally right thing to do. When we talk about the Rise and Shine programs, for those of you not deep in the program, th those may not make sense to you, they're for students who have uh, substantially separate settings. We want to bring those programs and the functional, which is in a gray area, and have them partnering with an academy so that they still get all the supports they would need in their substantially separate setting, but they also still get to interact in a meaningful way with the academies at elective levels and at classes where we feel like we can provide the supports so that they won't flounder. So we don't just want to have students who are used to a heavy level of support coming in and cutting them free and saying, OK, you're 14. Make all your choices in life. We're not going to support you anymore, because that would be incredibly unfair. But we also don't want to have them in the basement. Yeah, I, I have a 10th grader now over at Dean who some of the other kids make fun of and say, oh, you belong in the basement. I get pretty mad. But you know, uh, So we want to make sure those kids really get a fair shake, which are they now? I can't speak fully to it. But we know the Rise and Shine program could be a lot better integrated. And certainly the functional, there's a lot of room there to bring them into these electives, especially something 
where it's not as core content heavy. So you're not like, well, you have to pass this MCAS, so we want to give them more support there. But say it were a performance class or even a robotics class, there's no reason many of those students couldn't participate in a meaningful way with the proper supports. And I want to make sure we keep that tag on. I just want to make sure that, that it's known that these students make the same lengths. So um, the things that you're learning in your robotics class and your math that you're learning, you know, you, you think that you're playing with a robot, but for them they're actually learning major components that, that for them they're linking the pieces as you guys were speaking of. Um, so that, like I said, that's a huge concern for me. And I just want to make sure that special ed, you know, we've been forgotten. And we need to make sure that through this process, our students are no longer forgotten. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We need that equity of access for all. And as we're in this curriculum design process, which we've just started, we have an ELL support member. We have a special ed support member on our team. And I was just speaking with Karen, whose last name escapes me, who is a district special ed coordinator, about how we can build in from the get-go these access points for all students for these concentration courses. And I believe, um, I think Dana, in the last email, Dana Brown, um, there's a special ed committee that's been, that's a, reforming that was formed but is now like coming together so we'll be speaking with them as well to make sure that all of our students have access to these classes really quickly um the the two uh, teachers here who head up the rise and shine programs are absolutely making sure that we do not forget about their students um, my inbox can attest to that so just know that there are people here advocating for them every single day so yeah they do so, yeah. Mm -hmm. you had one more yeah, science and technology, technology and engineering, um, are all the academies, the four, I think you said four different ones, are they all going to have the same access to the basic core tasks? Meaning all your, all your mathematics, to include calculus, are they all going to have all the opportunities through the literature, through AP, all the way through AP courses? All of them, because my concern is it sounded like you were saying that if they're leaning towards engineering, they're going to be in these classes. Although it would help you know, if they decide to change their mind, and if they switch to a different academy, will they have access to the classes they need even at an earlier stage? Because if, if you're going to play catch up in your junior year to get, oh, you know, engineering is what I want. And, and then you're trying to catch up in calculus and, and trig and, and physics. And will those courses all be available in each of them? This is the easiest one, yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I would imagine that students in, in Megan and my academy m will get all the, I mean, we have to meet graduation requirements, right? Like, we have to. Um, I imagine that they might lean towards taking some more, like, humanities-based classes because of the nature of the academy they chose, whereas these two might um, choose to take more, like, math and science on top of the core, but the core will be there. So Nobody's going to tell someone in performing in media arts that they can't take physics. Right. Right. Will they both be on both campuses? I think we were talking we're about all that. We're all on this campus. campus. No, all, the, all these four academies are going to be on this campus for next year, yep. Question? Okay. Um, we, we keep talking numbers, numbers, numbers. I think this is brilliant. The average classroom size for a high school in Massachusetts is 23 kids. Right now, you're averaging about 30. So you have a 30% increase in number of students per class. How are we going to address that? Because it's easier to feed 25 than it is to feed 35 with whatever we're, we're providing for them. So what's being done to address the classroom size? Yeah, so, so right now we're, at, we're actually, we just came back from an all-night meeting yesterday, um, last night, <clears throat> with uh, an individual from, from outside the district, um, a consultant on master scheduling, because that is one of our top um, points that we're looking at right now is the classroom size, is is the, the the programs of study that we have, trying to identify you know how how this logistically is is going to 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 play out, and we're starting that process you know be well ahead of of the end of the school year, and we we do have supports from the outside the district that are that are uh, helping us focus our, our attention to address that specific issue along with uh, others. Yes. Yeah, this might be a little like inside baseball, but traditionally at Hoyoke High School, um, master scheduling, which I'm familiar with that concept in terms of like planning the schedule for next year, um, has started 
May-ish, maybe. Um, and we're starting thinking about it right now. So I'm really optimistic. And that's like the first time that's ever happened. So I'm really optimistic that we're going to figure this class size thing out because like you're not going to get any disagreement up here about that being a big issue. So. Big issue for me to work at a urban public school district. Yeah. So, and then again, how are we going to get more teachers in the building? Because again, we're going to offer AP classes, we need an AP certified teacher to come into the district to teach in Holyoke. Mm -hmm. are we, are we're hoping this cutting edge stuff is going to draw more teachers to the district. Because as we are all aware, retirements happen every single year. And if we can't replace the ones that are leaving, the sizes will just get bigger. Right. Do we want to pass that? Yeah, I don't think any of us can speak to recruitment. Efforts, um, but, but guess what? We have to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I want to believe, and these guys can, I'm not going to try to pass it back off to you, but I mean, I think people want to work in an environment that they're motivated to work. We talk about motivation of kids, um, but it's also about motivation of teachers. And when there's course, my, my experience has always been when there's courses and experiences that are, um, you know, cutting edge, innovative. Uh, people want to come work in, in those kinds of environments. You know, we, we didn't have a shortage of people who wanted to teach in the P3 program, for example, at Peck. We had people wanting to transfer in because it's a different way of teaching. Um, and, it's, and it's what people want. You know, they want to have the handcuffs taken off and to be able to do more interdisciplinary work. They want to link to the community. They want to have, you know, the, the capstone experiences with kids. Um, so I, I believe, and they, again, they can speak better to it, but it, it, would, it would seem that the direction we're going is, uh, at the high school level is one where uh, we would expect this, I would expect to see people want to teach in that kind of environment because it's why people get into the profession to begin with, you know, to begin with. So. Oh, yeah. One more question. It, since we're talking about teachers and classroom sizes, I think uh, that was a great question. Uh, uh, classroom management is uh, has been a problem in the schools. Um, so with that, I'm gonna like to talk about resources also. Um, and surveys that were done in the district, um, we've done surveys with students, parents, and teachers. The one that came up with teachers a lot were resources um, and the lack of resources. Um, so my question is now, um, do you think the resources that you have are adequate? And do you need additional resources for this program to fully function? I think the answer might be different for all of us. Um, I know I spoke to my academy. Um, I mean, one of the strands in my academy is media. And I mean, look at this wonderful television studio um, and performance. I think for my academy, I truly think that we, we're doing a lot of the stuff really good now and we have the resources now. Um, might we need like additional teachers or something? Yeah, but I think um, from my point of view, the program of study I'm laying out to take advantage of the strengths we already have, I don't think we need that much more additional, but that could be different for everyone. So, so one of the resources that I envision my academy uh, needing is, is support from um, local industry and community. Uh, industry, community, and uh, post-secondary higher ed um, entities. So for me, I'm, I'm searching out for individuals that will help support the curriculum, um, take groups of students outside of the classroom to their work, workplace. I'm working with um, environmental engineers. I, we've, we've had um, spots where the Mass Wildlife would, uh, is, is interested in partnering with us uh, around my, again, my academy. I'm speaking to my academy. Um, we have local um, colleges, Holyoke Community College, we have STIC, um, UMass, Amherst. We're, we're partnering with post-secondary level um, entities to, to help support spaces that would, would be useful in my medical um, concentration. So, so in terms of uh, resources, we're looking for, out, for my, my academy, looking for outside entities to help support uh, the curriculum and support those, those experiences with the students. Are you speaking to resources directly for the academies or just like resources in general that teachers need? Both. Both? Yeah, like I would echo theirs. Like we're using our university partners and our community partners as resources. And yes, I hope there will be funding. Like we're doing curriculum design. So in order to institute the curriculum that we have, there will need to be new supplies that are purchased to do that. So for me, as I look at resources in a, in a, dis, in a school district, there are people resources 
there's your teachers and your janitors and your administrators, and that's one type of resource. And then there's your physical resources, your books, your pencils, your computers. As a, a technology person, we rarely can't find a company who wants to give us stuff. They want to give us computers because they want those next generation of young people to be ready to work in their industry, where they actually want them to go to college after high school, but they want to start us early. So physical stuff, we don't have that huge a problem getting. People, that's always harder. One of the really innovative things that we're seeing, one of the innovative ways to leverage the resources our community has, because we're a community, Holyoke, and we have the resources we share with each other, as we all pay our property tax, we all share our resource here with the school. And if we can get the community colleges and the universities in the area to start to send us teachers or start to take our kids and do early college, that actually takes a good bit of burden off us. If a huge number of our seniors are already in college classes, that really frees up a lot of our human resources to be working harder with the freshmen and the sophomores. So we're hoping that this early college model, which is good for the student and good for the family and good for the community, can also be good for spreading our resources that are kind of thin a little more evenly. Yep. Sure. We've been waiting on the high school level to, for this model to roll out before we invested in new, new uh, curriculum resources, right? So we do have outdated curriculum resources that we have to update that are aligned to the model. We're waiting for the courses to be developed, and then we're going to invest in the curriculum we need to. So I see that as a big investment that we have to make. Transportation is a huge investment that we need to make because we already struggle with getting kids to Holyoke Community College, to UMass. We, we, we really need our, our own bus to be transporting kids. So that's an investment we're going to have to make is around transportation. Uh, we, we are going to have to make an investment around technology. We've invested a lot more at the elementary and middle school level with Chromebooks than we have even at the high school. We did replace the labs here, but we wanted to wait until we had a better sense of like, it's more than just like computers. It's some of it's the engineering, the robotics, um, you know, some of the media, not to shortchange you, Joe, but, you know, there are some overhauls we're going to have to make in some of the tech technology, but we wanted to wait until these academies began to roll out so we could align those resources. So we haven't invested as much at the high school level. We will have to. And then, of course, with teachers, um, you know, a lot of the issues around class size is driven by scheduling. It really is driven by scheduling. It's not a question of less resources. It, we have to start our scheduling now. And we have to, it is complicated, and it's that's why we had to bring in help. We didn't have the in-house expertise to, uh, to do it well. Um, I think there's a lot more we could be leveraging by better scheduling, you know, acro uh, across both uh, campuses. So, um, but we do have an influx of resources beyond just what the district contributes because of the foundational so the foundation support that we've received, and we're going to have to continue to p make that investment in our high school because we can't sh we're not going to skimp on what we think is a very important redesign uh, for the district. And, and to me, it starts with the high school, but eventually our middle schools are going to have to be better aligned to this, especially if we're investing in building two, <coughs> two brand new middle schools in Holyoke where, you know, we've already got an architect uh, slated for the one building or close to getting the architect selected for the uh, Lawrence School, middle, the Lawrence Site Middle School. But those middle schools are going to have to eventually be aligned to what th was happening here. And that's part of the long term you know, plan, but um, we, we have to make um, a significant investment next, starting next year. I just had a follow-up question. I'm going out of turn, sorry, um, but for you. But it's, it's more about the, you were talking about consultants and master scheduling and all really great supports for the school system. Can you tell me, um, and this may be a dumb question in terms of, um, maybe you already know the, <laughs> the answer, but the, but the purpose of having them come in and do this, is there standard work that they're developing so that when they're gone, we've taught people how to fish? Yeah, we have to build the, ca the capacity of the folks that are here. I mean, we're, uh, we have a group of teachers who we see more. I mean, they're, they teach, but they're also leading important work. And we've got to build the capacity, um, you know, f for many, many years. I mean, these guys don't have that many. Uh, we're missing some hair over there, Jake. But, I mean, these are young people who, uh, and Marcus is losing some hair. But they're, they're going to be, uh, you know, we, we need to invest in our people to lead this work for many, many years uh, to come. We've got to build capacity at the school level. And so while we may not have a lot of expertise in scheduling now, uh, the hope is that in the future we do have that expertise. Um, you know, 
you know, we have a lot of work to do with understanding what dual enrollment is, and our guidance, our guidance work has to improve because it's a whole re redesign of what guidance needs to look like, especially if kids are taking multiple courses across uh, multiple colleges and maybe across two campuses and in workforce development. I mean, um, this is hard. It's hard work. But we, we, we're going to need some help in making sure it's done well. We have to look at other models. We're going to have to bring in folks who have done this in other schools. But the end goal is, and I've told this story before, is I, I did, earlier this year I'm outside at Holyoke High. I'm sitting next to a, a girl on a bench before the school day is over. I thought she was skipping class. I said, what are you doing out here? And she says, I'm done for the day. I've taken all my courses. I have a free period. And, and she wasn't doing anything wrong. She just didn't have a class. But how, I mean, that's lost time. That's lost time with a senior who seems like a strong student, wants to go to college, but there's a gap in her schedule because we can't, we don't offer anything. You know, that's where they should be doing the kind of work that we're describing here, an internship, a capstone project, taking another course at a university. That's wasted time. And I've talked to the student council who've told me over and over again, like, we have too many gaps in our, especially as seniors, that we're not taking advantage of. And, and um, I want to see a more fluid campus. With, but with kids actually doing meaningful work, you know, whether it's here, whether it's at Holyoke, uh, hosp you know, the hospital across the street, whether, you know, whether it's at HCC, it's got to be much more seamless than it is now. And kids should be all over this community learning during the school day. A traditional high school, I mean, that's for, I mean, high school looks the same as when I was in high school, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that, that, there's people who are older than me. So I'll get to say when Mr. Brown was in high school. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just in the interest of time, um, I want to see if there's one more question. Um, Gloria. And then we'll cap off our evening together. Hi, my name is Gloria Urbina. Um, and I want to, first of all, tip my hat off to you guys for all the hard work that you're doing behind the scenes. can only imagine how heavy that, that may be. Um, my question is more along the lines of things that will add to the quality of life, I guess, at the high school's campuses. Um, re something that won't distract from all the hard work that's being done, like the phone usage, the earbuds, all of that kind of stuff that may distract students from actually learning what you're going to be putting forth. And who would be in charge of, of that? You know, that kind of stuff that would be distractions. There are distractions now that may be in the future. Like, is are you guys going to be having an input? Is it administration? Um, and also, to follow up on that, it seems that teachers not all are on board with putting things out timely, it, or using the technology available to them so that parents can then see what's going on. Is that something that you're addressing as well? Um, with this new s system, I guess? I think like as we move forward, sorry, um, team leads perhaps next year will be involved in that process in terms of their own academy, but it, I think it's also, it's collaborative. It's gonna be whomever is our executive principal next year and, and the team that is put in place as we roll these academies out like one year at a time. And we had a, a fairly interesting meeting last night around master scheduling, which you've heard of several times now. And they, they introduced something we'd heard of but not really pushed to the forefront, which is team teaching. So if you have 150 students, they all see the same English, the same math, the same history, the same science teacher. So that way when you have, but they're not, they're not they are not they do not travel all in, but it's, so it's a larger group. But that way those five teachers or six teachers can really start to build a set of norms and expectations that says phone use is only this time. Uh, we don't swear, we don't act like that in our space. And that smaller team teaching that is almost part of the academy I concept, where that team of teachers can really take responsibility for a smaller group of children, I think lets that, what we often see as poor behavior, slide less. Because they're talking to each other. Oh, does Jeffrey act that way in your class? Yeah. Oh, and he acts that way in your class? Yeah. We all need to sit down and talk to Jeffrey because there's a problem here. But sometimes if Jeffrey goes from class to class <coughs> and acts a little uh, unruly, the teachers don't really talk. They don't know. They just think, oh, I guess he's just that way with me. And so we're hoping building those smaller communities of teachers along with smaller communities of students 
will help us make that family of here's our expectations and there's not going to be any sliding. There'll still always be a little sliding, okay. But we're hoping to build that culture better through some of this teaming. Will there be time built into the teacher's schedule to allow for regular team time? Yes. Because the desk really needs it. Yes, that was, we worked hard on that last night. Yes, <laughs> I guess just about that though, what are the expectations of those five te teachers are far different from the other. So those five teachers, you know, cell phones aren't allowed, but these five say, hey, what's the big deal? It's a cell phone or, hey, you know, it's already here, but what happens to a cohesiveness as a school community? And that's as these, we, these are our expectations. <coughs> these are our rules and they are to be followed by all, no matter what team or what academy you decide to go into because it just seems to me if you've got five teachers saying it's okay here, then people, the kids are going to know that and guess what's going to happen? I'm going to see Mr. Crocheting today because he doesn't care if I put my earbuds in or, or text and be on my phone, opposed to going to see, you know, you know, Mr. So-and-so would be like, absolutely not, cell phones go in the, you know, go in the pockets or, or that's it. So I guess that's, a, it just seems like it's a little divisive rather than. I can so, totally see where you're coming from because that's one of the issues we see presently because each teacher is an island unto their own. So we presently see a lot of, here's the rules in my room, here's the rules in my room. And that's really challenging for a young person to have to code switch room to room. And they're like, oh, which room am I in? What are the rules here? And then they're like, oh, that kid acts crazy every fifth period because I teach it. So we know that it's not a perfect system where everybody's going to But if we have a leadership structure where the teams belong to academy leads <coughs> who set standards, and the academy leads belong to an administrator above them who sets the standards. And so there'd be one uniform set of standards. But there's some things that maybe there's flexibility about. Now, there's some things that the main administrator would say, these are our basic school rules. Here's your handbook. Everybody follows this. And then there's some other things that teachers just kind of arbitrarily have as rules in their room that maybe they make sense or maybe they're really upsetting to Jose because Jose is like, ah, I don't know why that's a rule here and not there. So we're looking for more uniformity. Now, I do understand how you are <coughs> saying less uniformity, but right now there's really only one school handbook and it's variably followed. So I guess, I guess we're just having to create a district because it almost sounds like they're going to run, mom won't do it, so I'm going to see dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if I don't get my way with mom, I'm going to run and find a teacher who's going to allow me to act the way I want to act. <coughs> In my world, this is how I want to act rather than saying, these are the school rules. And we abide by the school rules, you know, and it should be the same rules for all, everybody who chooses to be at this school, rather than picking and choosing what rules we're going to have. I think, well, so I think the problem is, like, you have um, four people up here who have worked really, like, hard on the curriculum and the program of study. In terms of what the school policy is going to be, um, I'm not sure we feel qualified to speak to that. Um, but I do think that, like... I believe strongly in what you're saying in the core rules. I think there's room for a little flexibility. I think, um, like right now, if you're in um, an English class and you need a pass to be in the hallway, that's like a school rule. If you're in physics and you're walking the hallway to measure whatever you measure in physics, <laughs> um, like the, it's understood that they can go out and do that, right? So there is a tiny bit of flexibility as it exists right now in those kind of things. I think that's what we're talking about. Like I don't envision my academy would be radically different. There would still be these core school rules, um, but I don't think I'm in a position to say what they would be at this point. And, and I also like to speak a little bit to that too. The, these academies will not be working uh, in silos. We, we, we will be a co cohesive school. We will be you know, working as, as, a, as a team, as a school community, uh, but we will also be working within smaller teams in which we will be owning our students and we'll, we'll be, We'll be really uh, digging into, uh, you know, not a cohort of, of just these 25 students, but we'll have a larger group of students that we'll be owning, and we'll be really, these will be our kids, you know? They, we'll, we'll, I'm not sure how, how best to say this, but these will be our, our students. Um, and it's, it's not, it's, it, I, I don't agree with, with the, the, you know, I'm going to do this in my room, and, and, and she's going to do that in, in her room. We're a team. This is this is a community, and we're all going to be working together through these issues. And and the cell phone issue isn't just an issue here; it's an issue everywhere. And it, as an as an example, as an example. And um, and so it, this is it's. I just want to 
drive home the point that you know we're, we won't be working in silos. We will be working together. Can I just add one thing? I, like just specifically to cell phones. I think what you're thinking is like so. Right now, if I'm in, I'm just gonna throw it at Joe. Like I'm in Joe's room and he lets me have my cell phone out all on the table. I don't know because somebody already said it all the time. I don't know that he actually does. And then I'm in Marcus's room and like it's in my bag and it's zipped up all the time. I think we have those overarching like school rules, whatever they may be. And then within the academies, like correlated across and then even individualized those we just put into place these rituals and routines around them so these are the expectations for the academy like the rule for the whole school is your phone is off and away unless your teacher asks you to take it out so but in this English class you know that when you come in the do now is a technological something that you're supposed to look up so that's a ritual and routine so you come in you take your phone out you complete the assignment and then you put it away like I think that was kind of was that kind of what you're gonna get like norming um, among the classes and not necessarily I also care about cell phones and earbuds, so I just <laughs> I just want to stop this slander of my good name that's happening here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.